it goes. Peter is on. Okay, yes, so I am. Hi, Peter. Thanks for coming on tonight. I know that I don't know what time zone you're in, but it it smacks of being, or unless you're back in the U.S. No, I'm still out of the country, and I'm not exactly sure where I am right now. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. That's good. Is it light or dark outside your window? It's dark. Okay, well, there it you go. Dark. It's dark here, too. So oh, we're virtually, cool. Yeah, we're virtually in each other's backyards. There we there are, separated by a large lake. So, so yeah. it's so great to have you on. Um, I, there are so many things to talk about, so many aspects of the kinds of research you've done, the books you've written, uh, obviously the videos you've made and the presentations you've made. Uh, I, you know, uh, where to start? I, I have to say that I was most fast. Well, there are uh, there are two aspects to um, your work that's uh, fascinated me. Um, our paths have crossed uh, on, on many occasions, but uh, just in terms, just like literarily. But um, one, it is in the third volume of Sinister Forces, where you're talking about the sinister forces of criminality, mainly Charles Manson. And I wanted to really get your take on the whole Manson story. You know, you'll tell your Manson, I'll tell mine, but go ahead. <laughs> right. Well, um, I was moved to study Manson because of that, that sort of throwaway line in Ed Sanders' book where he said, if the Pentagon ever formulates the Manson secret, the world's in trouble. And I thought, wow, you know, what a great line. And uh, haven't they already formulated the Manson secret? You know, I mean, Ed was writing back, you know, at the time when the Manson family uh, had been, you know, caught and captured and all of that. So we're talking the, uh, you know, the early 1970s, and um, the the whole story had yet to come out about, you know, mind control experiments, brainwashing, all the behavior modification stuff, psychological warfare, all of these things were just uh, about to come out. And uh, it led me to the idea that, you know, the Pentagon had formulated the Manson secret. So I wanted to know, you know, what that really was. Where did Manson come from? What was his background? And really, that was one of the main reasons why I started off on my journey to uh, cross the United States to see where he grew up and, um, you know, what environmental factors there might have been, since it seems like there were a number of really phenomenal cases of uh, serial murder in that region. And you had the Hatfields and the McCoys there as well, and you had Harlan County, and you had all these, um, all of this weirdness in, in Kentucky, in that area of Kentucky where he grew up in Ashland. So um, I wanted to find out, you know, what's, what is it? What does Manson represent? Why is he such an icon? Um, particularly as we know, he didn't commit personally any of the murders at the Tate LaBianca Households, you know, he, he gave the orders. Um, he was the the influence, the uh, the inspiration for all of it. He, you know, in one case, drove them to the LaBianca house or you know, was in the car, but actually did not, you know, participate in the actual killing. And yet, for us, he was, you know, the archetype of of evil. So I wanted to find out, you know, about Manson, and at the same time, maybe find out about us. You know, who are we? You know, as as a people in general, if we can generalize about American people at all. Uh, you know, what have we inherited? Um, I came to the conclusion that, you know, America is a kind of haunted house. Um, and, and Manson was kind of a, a, a medium for these ghosts, for these, uh, you know, for these forces that swirl around our, our country and our nation. So Manson was a, was a major key for me to this whole thing because his upbringing, uh, the time he spent in prison, which was most of his life, particularly the prison time he spent up at Terminal Island and the connections he made up there and the whole Scientology uh, connection, uh, as well as all the other occult stuff that was well, going on in California. So all of this just got me going. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the whole process, church background. And, and, sure. and, uh, and it's funny because when, you know, we interviewed Manson um, uh, um, um, in California, uh, obviously he was in jail at that point, to talk about um, you know, for the book Serial Killers, which uh, Joel Norris and I wrote. And the aspect about Manson was that so much of Manson's hatred for the system stemmed from the time he was a kid um, in a juvenile. Uh, he was incarcerated as a juvenile, and he talked about, first of all, he was, he's a little guy, and he's an angry little guy. Maybe not right. so much now anymore, but he was a really angry guy, a little guy. And 
he was talking about literally the sexual abuse that was going on in um, basically that juvenile incarceration uh, facility. Sure. Uh, I think it was in Illinois. Uh, he, he had stolen a car, and then um, he basically he killed his mother. Uh, he stabbed her to death in a beer hall, he said, in Michigan or something. And But that was really it. I mean, even what he was on death row for in Texas, the Orange Sox murder, was a murder he never committed. Otis Toole committed it and, 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 and admitted to it. So, right. I mean, he killed Kate Rich, and um, he killed uh, Becky, who was Otis Toole's niece, but he never committed 350 murders. And, uh, but, but it was fascinating, at least to us, because one of the things Manson kept on reiterating was how much, was how we gotten involved with what he said was a secret government that had wanted him to commit certain kind of murders. And sure enough, he's in jail and Squeaky from and, and, and that other person from the Manson gang make two attempts on the life of Jerry Ford. And you wonder why and why Jerry Ford. Sure. No, I mean, the whole Jerry Ford, Squeaky From thing is, is, is also fascinating. You know, I covered that a bit as well. I mean, um, I, I find her uh, sort of a key to this whole thing because she wasn't indicted for any of the, 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 the Tate LaBianca killings or anything like that. She was out on her own, you know, um, doing all this other stuff. But then she, she's, she falls in with, uh, with another Scientologist, too. You know, that's the other weird thing, yeah. that suddenly this, this guy is now living with them out, you know, where she is. And then the whole Gerald Ford thing, you, you know, the whole Gerald Ford thing to me is is very strange. I mean, Gerald Ford himself, you know, uh, is very strange. I mean, besides the fact of the Freemason connection and all of that, I mean, the guy was a male model, you know, um, for a while. And I'm not having anything against male models, but the agencies that he was working with are the same agencies that were involved with Candy Jones and the whole mind control uh, behavior mod thing that was going on with her. Right, um, Candy Jones. Wow. Yeah, Candy Jones for the audience was a model. She was basically um, recruited by this person Jensen, who it turns out was working for the CIA. This is back in the 1950s, late 40s, early 50s. She married Long John Neville. Part of the recruitment for the CIA for MK Ultra was that Jensen was trying to turn her into an assassin. A whole personality came out after she was married to Long John Neville, and through various types of regressive hypnosis. Long John basically brought out this other personality of Candy Jones, and, Don, and uh, Donald Bain wrote about it in the book uh, about Candy Jones, an astonishing story of what was going on with CIA mind control in the 1950s. Yeah, and I actually happened to have met Candy Jones back uh, in the 70s when she was still on, uh, still doing her radio show. I think it was WBAI, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I was on a, a show with her. I mean, she was interviewing me about something unrelated, having to do with uh, occultism. But, uh, you know, I, I was very impressed with her. I, you know, people have attacked the story, but I don't see any reason to attack it. I mean, the details that came out in Donald Bain's book, um, from my own perspective, rang pretty true. So, you know, that was another another connection that's very strange because uh, as you know from reading sinister forces i make the connection between donald bain and the whole murder she wrote uh, uh series on okay. television with with well, angela we, lansbury before we leave candy um did she seem like an intelligent woman or an airhead no she seemed quite intelligent in fact yeah. what she did was she was a model but she actually started her own modeling agency um, right. after her career as a model had ended, and it was partly because she was having a tough time with that agency making ends meet that she agreed to work for Jensen because she just knew Jensen from, from the war years and had no idea that he was CIA. Right. That's so, exactly true. So you have, you have the connection with Angela Lansbury, you know, who was the actress on The Manchurian Candidate, right? Of I mean, I mean, the whole thing started to get very strange to me. It was like this little nexus, this this small group of people who all seemed to know what was going on, you know, uh, and using these iconic people as, as fronts for for something more more sinister. It it just it fascinated me the 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 Hollywood um, brainwashing sort of mind control thing that was taking place on one level, and then all this serial killing on the other, uh, and you know. Uh, 
Charlie, I mean, Charles Manson, uh, you know, spent some time in Boys Town, of all places. I mean, he did, yeah, the very famous Boys Town, where he was also sexually abused like crazy, he said. Well, you know, there's also um, theories that mind control cults are created by abusing children. And so many, and, and when you were talking about Gerald Ford, that kind of flashed to that. You're kind of in the group forever if you're abused as a, as a young boy or girl. Well, it's also a, a way of creating, um, you know, multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder. I mean, it's the kind of trauma as a child that causes a child to dissociate. And dissociated persons, you know, for instance, in Candy Jones' case, there seems to be evidence that there was, a, you know, MPD or DID that was taking place so that she was easily manipulated. She had an alter personality. You know, we put on the dark wig and went out there and, and did the courier stuff or perhaps other things. And then, you know, she was somebody else entirely. So there's this idea that there was a creative application, you know, of, of trauma in young children to create this type of dissociation and to use it. And that's what really uh, disturbed me most of all and made me more interested in the story. I mean, Nick Bryant has been writing about, you know, the, the child abuse on, on a, on a institutional level it mentions Boys Town, you know, in, in the context of all of this. There, there's something very, very weird and very dark uh, um, taking place in the country. Sure, yeah. uh, have you, did you ever hear of, um, or have you heard of a, web, a website called Rigorous Intuition, a blog? Sure, sure. Okay. Well, they write about you. That's, of course, yeah. of course. But um, th that particular writer, he's a Canadian, and I can't remember his name, Wills, Jeff Will, Wills, I think, Jeff Wills, I think. Um, he talks a lot about ritual abuse, etc. And sure. um, I wondered if you followed, if you were on the internet following the death of the mysterious death of a woman and a young man a few years ago. Um, she was a blogger and a gamer and a perfume blogger of all things. She was a beautiful woman and she was involved with supposedly really deep, dark stuff. The, all of this kind of stuff we're talking about. And I'm trying to remember her name. Do you remember this at all, Peter? It, does, it doesn't ring a bell right now. Okay. Well, it was... Um, there's been much talk through on the... I'll, I'll try to find it all again. And so... Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was... You, you, it takes was a, this yeah. a game? Was this a real couple? Were they a game? Did they really... Is it a role? In other words, there, there's talk that the mind control folk, let's not even say CIA, but whatever MK Ultra evolved to, there's talk that it uses games online um, as a way of recruiting people and is this real or Memorex and stuff like that. Which is funny because so it's, it's also it's the all premise octopus of... octopus and tendrils. That are right, but it's also the premise of, of the science fiction novel Ender's Game about recruiting people online for various things, but it's not really a game and anyway. But I wanted to get back to this. So um, here's Jerry Ford. He's the um, object of a double assassination attempt. And, and, of course, you wonder why Jerry Ford. What did he do? What did he know? <clears throat> well, there were two aspects of Jerry Ford. And, of course, you link this in your presentation about the Hidden Space Program, which was this. Jerry, after the Hildale, Michigan um, sightings in 1966, it's the very famous explanation that um, Alan Hynek gave about swamp gas. But after those sightings which were really quite interesting in terms of what the people said. They saw humanoid figures and things like that. Jerry Ford writes to Mendel Rivers on the Armed Services Committee, demand, well, asking in a very polite way for an investigation into UFOs by, I'm sorry, by the House Armed Services Committee, and which was flatly rejected in... Um, the head of Project Blue Book at the time before it goes out of business, Quintero, I believe, just basically accuses Ford of being just a politician trying to make some hay. That's one. But four, three years before that, um, Jerry Ford, as a member of the Warren Commission, I know you write about the Kennedy assassination a lot, on the Warren Commission, and this was in the tapes. I got this from two sources. One was Philip Corso, who I wrote the book Day After Roswell with, but um, he was one source. But the other source was the Oval Office tapes that Lady Bird Johnson released and Michael Bechloss writes about. In those tapes, there is a, story, uh, there is a conversation that's recorded between Lyndon Johnson and Senator Richard Russell, also on the Warren Commission. Corso worked for Richard Russell on the Senate uh, Internal Judiciary Subcommittee investigating the Warren Commission. 
And um, Russell is telling the president that 